in. Greetings and welcome to the Farm to School and ECE Local Food Incentives Program webinar today. This webinar will focus on the national landscape and my name is Colleen Metz coming to you from East Lansing, Michigan and I'll be your host for today. So we've got an agenda that covers kind of four main buckets of information. We'll be talking quickly about definitions and the challenges of definitions around these programs. Then we'll dive into and spend the most of our time on the national landscape around these programs and then review some national survey results, which is really a sneak peek into a survey around interest and learning needs related to these kinds of programs. And then we'll wrap up with support available for those that are interested in pursuing these kinds of programs. And we should have time for discussion as the last portion of our time together today. That's what we expect. Uh, you can hold questions until then, or if questions are added to the chat, we'll do our best to answer them as we go, or we'll hold them um, for discussion at the end of the session. So we'll, man it, we'll do our best to tend to all of the questions. Um, and if we can't get to everything, we'll certainly be able to follow up afterwards too. So then to go on to introductions for today, I'll ask um, Cassandra to introduce herself. Yeah, sure. I'm Cassandra Bull. Um, I am a current policy intern at the National Farm to School Network, and I'll be discussing the research from my graduate thesis, which I did at Tufts University, where I was an environmental research fellow. Thanks, Cassandra. And we also have Karen Spangler joining us today. Hi, Karen Spangler. I'm the policy director at National Farm to School Network, and I'm located in Washington, D.C., but uh, formerly um, lived in Michigan for my whole life until I relocated here. So especially happy to be um, together today. Thank you. And my name again is Colleen Matz, and I'm the director of Farm to Institution Programs here at the Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems. I also coordinate the Michigan Farm to Institution Network, and I'm part of the team leading evaluation for our 10 cents a meal local food incentive program here in Michigan. So that's part of what brings us all here today. So first off, we'll dive into definitions, and that's mostly just to say that it's really challenging to set forward a precise definition of local food incentive or reimbursement programs. And that's really because they're designed and administered in different ways across different locations to meet different goals um, in local areas. So you'll see here, Cassandra's definition is a bit different from the definition that I'm working with here at the Center for Regional Food Systems. And we'll go through these a bit more um, as we go. I know Cassandra will talk more about her um, definition related to her landscape research work, but just wanted to acknowledge that there is inconsistency out there around these definitions. And those of you listening who are working on these programs or supporting these programs might think of them differently too, and that's okay. So I'm just asking that we can hold on to having different definitions and ways of talking about these programs out there. And maybe we'll get to a more precise definition and maybe we won't as things continue to evolve and adapt as we go. Um, and I think that's following the natural progression of things as people are testing out and trying out different ways to operate these programs. I also wanted to touch on structures of these programs before we dive in a bit more. Local food incentive programs in K-12 and ECE settings often differ from, but sometimes they might be a part of, more general farm to school grant programs that fund various activities related to farm to school. So school gardens, education, and local food procurement, those core elements we know of farm to school. And there may be some overlaps, but these programs are often typically distinct from other types of healthy food incentive programs that are intended to stimulate 
local food purchasing among a broader array of community members, and that includes households with children through farmers markets and other retail settings. So programs like Double Up Food Books. So this is different from that, even though that has a similar aim because of the setting. So just wanted to kind of note, we're trying to distinguish um, the different structures, but that's also not clear. And that leads to kind of that muddiness around definitions. I also wanted to note that our lens for discussing local food incentive programs will typically focus primarily on state level policies funded by state legislatures, but it's really important to note that they can occur and be supported at various geographic levels by diverse funding partners and policy partners. And piloting these programs on a smaller local level may even be one of their keys to longer term success and sustainability. And I think the Michigan 10 cents a meal program is definitely a case in point for that. It was piloted in one local area of the state um, by some of our brave nonprofit partners before it became a regional pilot at the state level, before it became a statewide program. So um, that evolution is important to keep in mind. So we're talking about state level programs here primarily today, but there's certainly good practice around piloting at a smaller or local level. And with all of that in mind, um, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Cassandra Bull, to share findings from her research into these types of programs around the country. Awesome. Thanks, Colleen. And thanks to everyone here for your interest in our webinar. My name is Cassandra Bull. Again, these findings are from my graduate work at Tufts University, where I graduated just a few months ago in August. Today, I'm presenting on my thesis topic entitled Design Thinking, Analyzing the National Farm to School Local Procurement Incentive Landscape. I want to first acknowledge the time and support of the many food system professionals I spoke with for this project, and I especially want to thank Colleen for being a sounding board and for a commitment to continue this research. Here's an overview of how this presentation will go. It'll be about 25 minutes on my end. First, I'll provide an introduction to my research topic and my objectives, then I'll describe my methodology, then an overview of my main three findings, which align with the three large chapters of my report, and lastly, I'll share my recommendations for both researchers and policymakers. So I'm assuming we all know the basics of farm to school, but farm to school programs have been expanding over the last three decades with an estimated $1.26 billion in local food sales and 60,000 schools participating in activities in 2019. Local food sales increased 12% per year from 2015 to 2019, according to the USDA farm to school census. My research focuses on procurement specifically in which schools source and serve local food in the cafeteria. And there's extensive research into the potential benefits and barriers of local food procurement, but a particularly ubiquitous barrier is the high cost of local ingredients. So acknowledging this, state governments have made considerable efforts to promote policy, uh, farm to school through policy intervention. One type of policy that's gaining momentum are local food incentive programs in which governments and the District of Columbia, which I'm calling a state, provide school food authorities and other child nutrition programs, but I'm gonna use SFA as a blanket term here. Um, they give them a specific amount of additional funds to partially or completely offset the cost of local ingredients. So basically, if a school buys food from a local producer, they will get actual money back from the government. To date, there are at least 15 states that have established incentive programs with over $30 million allocated for these programs nationally in 2021 alone. You can see them on the map here. More than half of all incentive policies have been established since 2018, and states have tremendous flexibility in designing these policies, but little guidance on the range of models in which they can use to develop an incentive program. For about four years, I worked as a farm to school coordinator in New York State, um, which has an incentive program. And working within the nuances and complexities of this policy often made my, myself and my colleagues wonder, how are other states accomplishing a similar goal? So my guiding research question is, 
How do statewide farm to school incentive programs vary with respect to program design, context, and alignment to existing farm to school policy goals? To do this, I observed characteristics of the programs and synthesized emerging and diverging themes throughout the course of this research. My data collection process included identifying the state programs, reviewing secondary sources, and conducting interviews with key stakeholders. So in total, I interviewed 19 informants from 14 states. Most of these informants were coordinators at the state level and the rest were nonprofit partners. There are several intended audiences for my research, policymakers and practitioners who wish to implement uh, an incentive program, current practitioners of incentive programs who are looking to build a community of practice, uh, this research can also inform the work of agencies that have already adopted incentives as they evolve, expand, and refine their programs, and farm to school researchers like myself. The value add of this report is finding and listing the state incentive programs in detail, which had not been done before, analyzing variations within a united farm to school movement rather than researching these programs individually, which had been done before, creating classification schemes and charts, and aggregating and sharing stories and quotes from informants about their experiences with incentive programs. I wanna be really clear that the value from this research, in my opinion, exists in the nitty gritty details, from the examples of successes, challenges, unintended consequences, and the background of why a state would choose a particular design over another, in the full report, each subcategory of each design element I'm about to talk about is padded and enhanced with this kind of additional information. And we simply don't have the time to talk about all of that today. But there is a 100-ish paid report uh, that's available along with a research summary, which is about a quarter of the length of the report. And supplemental products of this study are a farm to school program compendium, which provides more in depth three to four page overviews of the incentive programs um, in each of the states, as well as links to websites and supplemental sources. And then there's also a Google Drive folder with compiled practitioner documents like RFAs, tracking spreadsheets, and evaluations if they're available. This is an image of what Alabama's overviews uh, looks like. So my findings. The first finding relates to design elements. No two incentive programs are identical and there's great diversity in program designs. There are seven main categories that I found best describe how these programs differ. Their eligibility, reimbursement determination, funding avenues, allowable costs, the kinds of meals incentivized, the kinds of child nutrition programs that can participate and program sides. The report also provides more detail around which specific states made different decisions, why they made them, and what they've experienced because of those decisions. Um, these are examples of what charts in the report look like. Um, they provide a breakdown of categories and um, some categories by state. So eligibility describes how interested SFAs can participate in their program's incentive. There are three main ways that SFAs can become eligible for an incentive. The first is competitive grant application. SFAs must first submit an application demonstrating their intent to participate in the program in order to be considered for funding. So about half of the states have a competitive grant application. And I'm using competitive lightly. Uh, the next is universal eligibility in which all states will receive funding as long as they follow the program structure for reimbursement. This can help reduce barriers to participation. And the last is performance-based. Here, SFAs are only eligible for reimbursement once they reach a, a certain local food procurement threshold, like 20%, 30%. Um, this can raise equity concerns, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And several states have included variations to these three main designs. For example, Oregon has both a competitive grant and a universally eligible program. Utah and Vermont both have sliding scale performance-based programs in which their reimbursement rate increases when SFAs purchase a higher percentage of local products. Reimbursement determination. This describes how qualifying SFAs are reimbursed for program-related expenditures. There are four main ways in which states do this. 
there's a lump sum, which is based on a per meal formula. So in this model, SFAs are typically notified that they're entitled to a maximum award. And this occurs before SFAs make local purchases with the intent of getting additional reimbursement. This award is calculated by multiplying a predetermined number like meals served in a specific time frame, ADP, enrollment, by a specific dollar amount set by the regulating authority, like 12 cents. More than half of state programs use this model of, re of reimbursement determination. Next is a lump sum not based on a per meal formula. So in this model, awards may be made based on multiple criteria and might not conform to a formula, but SFAs are notified what they're entitled to before purchases are made. Next is a per meal reimbursement. So in this model, SFAs are reimbursed based on the number of meals um, that they serve that feature a qualifying local ingredient. So unlike the lump sum based on a per meal formula, which has a predetermined maximum amount that's established before procurement, the per meal model reimburses SFAs for each meal after they purchase ingredients. One variation to a per meal model is a per component model in which SFAs are reimbursed if they serve a meal that features a full local food component rather than incorporated an ingredient. And then there's matching. So these awards are typically viewed as rebates, where an SFA will be reimbursed a percentage of what they spend on local food. So matching reimbursement models were the least prevalent among states, and the matching percentages range from like one to three or a one to one match. There's also many nuanced variations in how states determine reimbursement for SFAs. So often states employ slight variations or have multiple categories. Um, these variations are denoted in the other column in the report. Next is funding avenues. So more than 70% of incentive programs are funded through general budget appropriations, but there are some unique avenues used to fund these programs like a liquor tax in Utah, a bag tax, COVID-19 relief funds, and by piggybacking on larger agricultural development efforts in the state. Incentivized purchases. So a major difference between these programs can be found in what they do or do not incentivize with taxpayer dollars. The primary categories include fresh fruits and vegetables, proteins, grains, minimally processed items, processed items, fluid milk, and value added dairy. Secondary categories include school garden produce, non-food items, and food purchased through government programs. This is a chart I rotated and zoomed in to show you as an example. Minimally processed and fresh unprocessed fruits and vegetables are incentivized by all the programs. All but one state incentivizes grain. All but two states incentivize value-added dairy and local proteins. And the items least likely to be incentivized were processed items and fluid milk. All states, with the exception of Washington, D.C., for obvious reasons, use a state border definition for local, fresh, and minimally processed products. Many states voiced an interest in adopting a regional definition of local, but they also recognize the potential political and administrative hurdles that might come with a regional definition. Some states use existing definitions of local from other programs or state departments um, to define local for processed products. And most states used a 51% local ingredient or greater definition for processed products, but several others didn't have a minimum ingredient threshold or they have more nuanced regulations. For secondary categories, most programs allow SFAs to purchase items that go above and beyond the primary foods that are typically purchased through food vendors. So for example, a vast majority of states allow school garden produce to be purchased for their programs. Only one state, Michigan, allows local foods purchased through federally funded programs as part of their matching requirement. And a third of programs allow non-food costs as allowable costs, such as equipment, staff time, transportation, and educational materials. These kinds of purchases can help build SFA capacity for scratch cooking and foster more educational activities. Next is types of incentivized meals. This detail I think is important because it determines who will most benefit from the program. And it can also describe how intensive reporting is for SFAs. 
A vast majority of programs help subsidize local food purchases served in all NSLP reimbursable meals. Four states, however, allow their funds to be used in a la carte or adult or staff meals. Most states didn't restrict their funding to a particular meal like lunch or breakfast, even though their award calculations might be based on lunch participation or something like that. The next is types of child nutrition programs participating. So NSLP, CACFP, SFSP, SSO, and then I made a separate column to distinguish ECE and non-school partners. This decision will dictate when local food can be purchased, so only in the school year, in the summer, et cetera, and who in a community can participate in the program. All 15 states incentivize reimbursable lunch meals served in NSLP. Um, CACFP, SSO, and SFSP are less likely to be included in these incentive programs. And then Pennsylvania's grant program is an outlier because the grant is specific to food purchased for K through five levels only. Um, there's also a growing effort I wanted to highlight from states to expand their incentive programs into other spaces outside of school. Um, and this is usually to reach a larger and more diverse subset of the population. Thus far, seven states have incentive programs that reach ECE and non-school partners. And states that have expanded into ECE settings have experienced unique implementation challenges by working with these populations. The last is program size. So states provide anywhere from five to 25 cents per meal or per component. More than two thirds of states use a per meal formula um, that use a per meal formula provide 14 cents or less per meal for their incentive. Several states have created artificial minimum awards for applicants. So this helps make the program more worthwhile for smaller sized applicants who, if they're using a per meal formula, might get $400 a year. And then there are maximum caps on programs. So many states implement a maximum grant award or cap their award um, such that they have funds for multiple applicants. For the program budget size, the overall budgets range from $220,000 to $10 million. Um, this is in 2021, and that's per year or per biennium, depending on the state's legislative cycle. Many new programs have been introduced as pilot programs and have not been given permanent funding. And states with more established programs have seen their program budget fluctuate greatly over just a short amount of time. And I think Michigan's a great example of that. The next finding revolves around context. So while there's a great diversity in the context of these programs, many states actually shared similar implementation challenges. And states have integrated additional unique support structures into their programs to contend with these challenges. So first an overview. These programs are bipartisan, meaning that they were established and implemented under both Republican and Democratic governors, though most governors were Democratic. They were found in all geographic regions of the US. They were found in the most populous and second least populous state. More than a third of states had one or more FTEs to run their program. Most programs were ran by the Department of Education, closely followed by the Department of Ag. More than half of programs were established by outside advocacy groups. And all states had support from outside partners. All states also had at least one additional program or policy to support farm to school in their state. I've listed examples of partner support and other programs and policies in the full report. So there were common challenges for the three main actors of these incentive programs, the state agencies, SFAs, and producers. I'm going to highlight a few of the main challenges. So for state agencies, some challenges were navigating strict or flawed legislation, developing administrative systems from scratch, tracking expenditures, and collecting data and evaluation. Common challenges for SFAs include verification and documentation of local products, um, finding local producers, not understanding program rules, staff turnover, and labor shortage. And common challenges for producers include the lack of local food supply or supply chain preparedness to meet this new additional demand, food safety training and knowledge, and complications from the producer side in understanding program regulations such that their products qualify for reimbursement. 
Some states have found unique ways to contend with implementation challenges by including these like additional design elements. And these are additional supporting elements. So they're not the seven categories I just outlined, um, but they still have tremendous value and potential in aiding implementation, which is why I'm gonna highlight them now. Some states have incorporated flexibility, such as reallocating expenses to allow for full utilization of funds, creating flexible farm to school incentive legislation to account for unforeseen hiccups, which there will be, and embedding participatory decision-making to hear what is working and what is not directly from their stakeholders. States have utilized program funding for purposes outside of procurement, including outsourcing evaluations, contracting technical assistance from partner nonprofits, providing additional funding for SFAs that participate in training, including one or more coordinator positions, earmarking funds for specific target populations, such as tribal communities or ECVE partners. Um, and this is to ensure that everyone is benefiting from the program and creating alternate pathways to enter their program at low or no risk by including things like seed grants. States have also improved structural elements in their programs, like providing or requiring an approved vendor or product list, embedding programmatic systems within typical SFA routines, like the monthly claims process, uh, creating standard tracking tools, creating opportunities to provide wraparound services like networking um, to both SFAs and producers, and by reaching out to support producers through their data input and verification process. The last finding involves goals. So, what is the intention of implementing this kind of program to begin with? Explicit programmatic goals I found did not always translate into the designs of the programs and vice versa. So the five goals I analyzed include community engagement and equity, economic development, education, environment, and public health. These were the five like headers from the National Farm to School Network's benefit fact sheet. This chapter includes large charts that look like this, um, that show how states explicitly mention their goals, incorporated goals into their design elements, and mention these five goals as indicators of what a successful program looks like to them. So if I'm a policymaker looking to develop an incentive program, I can use these charts to examine how states have listed goals like community engagement and equity explicitly, like how Washington, um, listed that their goal was to increase purchasing from historically underrepresented farmers and ranchers, or they could have incorporated this goal into their program design through universal eligibility or by prioritizing high need communities through grant scoring criteria. You can also see how some design elements might work against community engagement and equity, such as competitive programs and performance-based eligibility which again only gives SFAs a subsidy if they've achieved a particular local food percentage threshold. This can disincentivize SFAs who don't have the means to purchase high levels of local food without that guarantee of a subsidy. Lastly, they can look to see how state coordinators have defined what successful community engagement and equity looks like, and then they can use this as part of an evaluation strategy. For example, the program's ability to diversify uptake among SFAs in their state, which can be measured by the number of participating SFAs that are new to farm to school, the number of SFAs with more BIPOC population or lower socioeconomic status, and so on. So more details for this goal and the remaining four goals can be found in the big charts in the report. And this leaves me with recommendations. So I have two sets of recommendations. Many of these were aggregated from my informants at the state level, and I explicitly asked them for their recommendations in the interview process. For researchers and supportive partners, I recommend create a community of practice among state coordinators. There was a strong desire to do this, as many of my informants didn't know who their contemporaries were or which states even had similar incentive programs. Create a searchable database for incentive program materials and keep it up to date. Conduct an analysis of incentive-based program legislation, language, and history, which can help states in their developmental process. 
include food service director and SFA level input to get their opinions from experience on these programs, operationalize this classification scheme I'm sharing to compare state programs directly, and study the causes and effects. So investigate how some of these specific program elements have led or could lead to specific outcomes. For my recommendations for incentive program designers, coordinators, and policymakers, I break these into different aspects of incentive design. The first is the design process. Conduct extensive research before starting the program. Incorporate as many stakeholders into the design process as possible, especially SFAs. Start small with a pilot. Develop clear goals and bake them into the program and use intentionally flexible language in legislation. For program supports, provide technical assistance to stakeholders wherever possible, embed a funded coordinator position or several, require and even finance evaluation in legislation, and collaborate with partners on work that they're already doing. The last is design attributes. So make the program as simple and user-friendly for participating SFAs as possible. They have a lot going on in their lives. Um, incorporate other local food promotion programs into your work. Embed professional development. Reflect on key considerations. So what happens if there are unspent funds? Should there be a cap on award amounts? Who defines local? How, uh, who will be responsible for vetting suppliers and their products, and how long do you think that will take? How will purchases be reviewed and tracked by the authorizing agency? And how does the program promote accessibility and bake in equity? And lastly, consider designing a program that creates transformational change rather than one that acts as a band-aid for the school food funding gap. While these recommendations may not be feasible for each state's context, I believe we can benefit tremendously from reflection, collaboration, and learning from one another's lived experiences. The nuanced differences in each policy can drastically alter how the program is accessed and perceived by stakeholders. The decisions one makes in the design and implementation of these programs has the ability to greatly impact the livelihoods of children, farmers, and communities, hopefully for the better. And with that sentiment, I conclude my presentation and will pass it back to Colleen. Thank you. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. We've got a ton of great information there. And um, I definitely recommend you take a look at the materials that Cassandra put together. And for those of you who are you know, knee deep in this kind of work like I am, I found her whole thesis to be a fascinating read, um, but I know we're her target audience, so definitely take a look. So um, wanting to take that as kind of the big picture and then think about where we go from here. And um, one thing that we did was to conduct a national survey that was intended to better understand interests and education needs of stakeholders like you all related to K-12 and ECE based local food incentive or reimbursement program. So I wanna give you kind of a sneak peek into some of the findings from a very simple national survey that we conducted earlier this year. And these results will be shared through a short summary that will be coming out in the very near future. So in April of this year, staff, us from the Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems developed and launched a national survey. And we worked with partners at the National Farm to School Network, namely Lacey Stevens before she departed and Karen Spangler on the design of those survey questions and the contact list. And Cassandra and Karen also reviewed the forthcoming summary and Karen provided some really great input on some of our graphics too. And then we worked with partners um, who are evaluation partners of ours um, at the University of Michigan to develop the electronic survey. So in April, um, I sent a survey request and link to directly to individuals across all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and some US territories and tribal entities. 
And the initial contact list was compiled from a database maintained by the National Farm to School Network, including contacts for current partners, as well as for a group of state partners who are Farm to ECE Implementation Grantees, otherwise known as FIG. So for those who may not already know of FIG, it operates in 10 states and Washington, D.C., and is coordinated by the Association of State Public Health Nutritionists as one of their Farm to ECE grant programs. And just to be clear, when we say ECE, we mean early care and education. So after duplicate and undeliverable email addresses were removed, a request to complete the survey was sent out to 350 unique email addresses. We sent the first request on April 13th, and then it closed two and a half weeks later. And we collected a total of 144 responses for a 41% response rate. So you can see here the affiliations of our respondents who provided that information when they responded to the survey. One fifth or 22% of our survey respondents did not include their affiliation in their survey response at all. So you'll see here the others that did. Um, respondents represented 45 states in Washington, DC. And in some cases we had multiple people from the same organization or program who responded to the survey. Locations with the most respondents included Virginia with 12, Connecticut with eight, Ohio with eight, Pennsylvania with seven, Michigan with six, and Washington DC with six respondents. So we did ask about values related to these local food incentive programs. And in addition to prioritizing food that is produced locally, survey respondents were definitely interested in incorporating other values into these programs. And you'll see those responses here. So they include supporting BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, and People of Color producers, purchasing food that's grown with environmentally sound practices, prioritizing nutritional quality, producing supporting producers that respect workers' rights and supporting animal welfare. Some other themes that emerged from open-ended responses were interests in supporting small-scale producers and beginning farmers and ranchers, and other values suggested by just one or two respondents each were prioritizing organic food, supporting women farmers, supporting a universal school lunch program, and development of culinary skills. And you'll see that almost all, 97% of our respondents are interested in learning more about local food incentive programs. And the top five topics of interest are listed here. Um, how existing programs are administered, personnel and teams that support the programs, tracking and reporting for participants, evaluation tools and activities, and ways to address equity and those other value-based attributes in food procurement. There was less interest, but still interest in learning more about outreach, policy advocacy, bill language to establish programs, storytelling and position descriptions for personnel administering these programs. So these are the topics that can guide our education journey collectively going forward. And these results in general um, confirm and reinforce that there really is a swell of interest in local food incentive programs in K-12 and ECE settings across the country. And the survey is just a tiny snapshot in time, um, but it shows the needs and priorities of stakeholders and that can guide awareness building, education, resource gathering and sharing efforts. There's a lot to be done in that realm. And these learning interests in particular will help guide the development of a forthcoming webinar series, um, which will be continued likely in 2023, focused on sharing practical tools and tips for different aspects of implementation with speakers, some on the line here today from different places with programs in operation. So we can really dig into not just how to advocate for these programs, but how to run them once they are actually funded and in operation. 
So we'll look forward um, to sharing more information with you as we go. And at this point, I will transition over to Karen Spangler with the National Farm to School Network to share more about how they can support these efforts. Thank you, Colleen. This is um, awesome the information presented so far. I'm excited to be on the line with everyone today. So um, I think probably most people may be familiar with National Farm to School Network, but if they're not, we're an anchor organization with the Farm to School movement nationally, and we are a hub for information, networking, and advocacy. So that's part of what I do in my role as policy director is um, connect people to resources to other people and to policy and engagement opportunities, including um, on local procurement incentives. Um, so that's something that we can help um, if, for those who are interested in implementing or expanding. Um, I'm going to go into some of the ways that we can support that work. Great. So one of the longstanding resources that we have at National Farm to School Network is the State Farm to School Policy Handbook. So the most recent version was released in 2021, covering the legislative sessions 2002 to 2020, um, looking at trends and sample policies um, or examples of policy language in farm to school, um, covering those core elements of procurement, hands-on gardening, nutrition education. So this is a tool for people who are interested in advocacy or just learning more about what might be in place in their state or other states to learn about the existing programs, to compare some of the laws and models. Definitely not as in-depth as Cassandra's resource today, um, but looking at some of the strategies that have been used by different states, DC and territories, and looking um, and actually finding finding those policies um, you know, by name and policy number so that you can look at that example language. So some strategies to advance those um, as well. Additionally, we have a new tool uh, that is an interactive map of newly introduced policies in farm to school, farm to ECE, and related areas of child nutrition and producer support. Um, I will, I thought that I included the link on here, but I will find the link in a moment and drop that in. So this includes policies that have been introduced um, and allows, uh, allows the public to see what might be introduced or enacted or just in motion in your state. So that's a new tool as of earlier this year to help support advocates um, and people who are implementing as policies are actually being proposed. And one of the big ways that we can support farm to school advocates is uh, with these benefits of farm to school impact information. So as Cassandra mentioned, we have these subject areas of farm to school benefits that have been documented through research, um, rigorous research, uh, and we can share that with the public, with policymakers to help everyone understand, you know, whatever the goal is, um, there is probably a way that a farm to school activity can help support that impact. So whether it's demonstrating the economic development potential, the public health impact for kids, for families, the educational outcomes that it helps, um, the environment and equity and community engagement impacts. Um, we have literature available. This is a compendium that cites all of the sources so that you can dig down for yourself and help to um, uh, have support for illustrating those impacts when you're building awareness about the benefits that local procurement policies can have um, so that they're, they're great, but they also have these impacts that um, we want to advance. As part of this, we have created a new campaign that actually is uh, launching a new website starting later uh, later this week to talk about who is the table for school meals. So universal free school meals um, are one, at one tool that can help to expand the reach and the impact of farm to school, of local procurement. Um, a strong child nutrition programs are foundational for the impact of local procurement incentives. And so we want to talk about and build awareness amongst the public about who is at the table, right? It's kids who are served by school meals and uh, 
the potential that it has to transform their lives and their education by universal access, but also to create awareness of these positive impacts and how that reverberates down the full supply chain of everyone involved, educators, um, school food professionals, distributors, producers, farmers and farm workers, um, everyone involved in uh, in this food system. And as part of the you know farm to school, we want to lend our voice to the call for universal free school and early care meals with a unique perspective, looking at who is at the table, making sure that the food gets there. So I invite everybody to come check it out. Um, and I'll, I think the next slide is, just an example of some of the workshops that we've had so far through this campaign. So how to talk to your candidate, including some um, featured speakers who are on the line here today. Um, so we're trying to provide tools to members of the public, to partner organizations, to potential advocates. Um, this is an example of our candidate engagement webinar where we talked about um, the importance of nonpartisan educational outreach to candidates running for office to talk to them about uh, farm to school, about child nutrition, um, about the issues that are important to you. Um, and you can watch the recording of that webinar at the link here, and then I'll make sure to include it um, uh, in any follow-up as well. So this is how we're trying to you know, arm our advocates uh, with the information and the skills that they need to, to advance these policies. We also have, uh, through our staff, uh, we do evaluation and impact of some of the policies uh, that support farm to school. So this is an example from um, uh, the DC Healthy Tots Act uh, incentive policy that my colleague Lacey, who um, Colleen mentioned, worked on and looking at what are the impacts, what are the recommendations to improve. So we're able to as a national organization, work with our um, state and DC and territory partners to talk about the successes, the challenges of implementation, and do research that provides uh, policy recommendations for more impactful and equitable policies. And I wanted to make sure to invite everybody to our movement meeting. So again, with this theme of who is at the table, uh, as a national organization, we can support these state policies by building connections between uh, and building power in the movement for farm to school. So we want to invite everybody to our movement meeting for farm to school month on October 27th. And I will drop the link in the chat. And this is for anybody who is an interested stakeholder in farm to school. Um, looking at the future of the farm to school movement, how we can build power together. Um, and again, looking at all of the people valuing everyone who is involved in getting food to the table in child nutrition programs and beyond. And I think that's it for me. So I'll leave some time for questions. Thank you, Karen. And um, I know we've got some things that we can drop into the chat in terms of links to additional resources. Karen dropped the movement meeting info there. And I should have welcomed everyone by saying happy Farm to School Month. Failed to do that. And for some of us, um, that also means it's um, crunch month. So we just did our Michigan Apple Crunch here at the office the other day. Um, so Happy October to everybody. Um, Cassandra, there was also a request for the link to your um, report and materials. So if you could drop that into the chat too. And at this point, we could take questions if there are any. I haven't seen any other questions yet in the chat, but there's a lot of info here. Colleen, I actually have a question. Hello, Melanie. Go for Hi. it. 
Hi, um, thank you everybody for your presentation. Um, really great information. Um, Cassandra, I see that you're dropping the folder in the chat, thank you. And I'm just wondering about, it sounds like from the intent you want this information to be used. So I just wanted to check to see if it was free to share because you did so much work here and it's really fantastic. And I am actually working with a graduate class who's, who is looking at 10 cents a meal. Um, I'm here in Michigan, and I think this information would be really helpful for them. So I'd love to share it with them if you're open to it. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I was very specific about conducting research that is useful for people. So as these incentive programs are gaining in popularity, I really do hope that we can share these resources with different states that are thinking about implementing these programs and just get everyone more informed on what's already out there and what we've learned. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi, Cassandra. This is Britt Martins in Colorado. Um, we have a farm to child collaborative here. We are a big state, so it is supported through that. And as that, we have a work group. Uh, our work group is around increasing purchasing power for early care and education providers. And we're doing a deep dive right now into incentive programs and the templates they use to collect their data each month, kind of what they require from farmers. Um, are they going down into the level of, is this a marginalized you know, population? Is it a BIPOC farmer or a female farmer? And looking at what data they're collecting essentially. And I was curious if you had done any work in that area or had anything you could share. We don't like to do repetitive work, so to speak. Yeah, I think I'll partially answer that and then maybe pass it to Colleen or Karen. So I collected the tracking spreadsheets, which is in the Google Drive um, as much as I could, though I haven't done like a specific analysis on what states are collecting what information that was a little bit deeper than what I got. Um, I do know that there is a farm to school metrics collaborative and that there um, has been more discussions about uh, specific to incentives, the metrics that they're using. So I'll pass it to the other two if, if they want to add. Karen, did you have anything you wanted to mention there? Oh, yeah, I guess just that um, from the from the metric side, I would say that like the, the capacity for data collection has definitely come up as an issue, especially related to um, on the ECE side, because the providers are usually um, smaller and much less likely to have a dedicated um, food service person. So um, I think in terms of, I also want to flag that in terms of policy design, it's sort of not just what's tracked, but also um, who you're asking to do the tracking. Um, and that that's one thing that is or can be a little bit easier about incentives that have uh, either specific or limited types of products versus ones that are um, more expansive as well. And I think um, we certainly have information from Michigan that we could share, but I think that is part of um, Cassandra's folder there. And more generally speaking, I think in longer term, um, this is really what we need um, in terms of developing a community of practice of sorts around these types of programs where we can have um, build on what Cassandra has already done and pulled together here and have a resource and kind of a library for folks to access the types of tools um, and materials they could use or could adapt and um, run with from there. So that's something that I'm hoping to, with Cassandra's foundation here, add on to um, in the coming year as we gather more around these conversations. So as we dive into some more of these specific topics and tracking um, and evaluation is one of them, then we can be gathering up more tools and resources that people use and just have a place for people to access them. So that doesn't help you right at this moment, um, but I think Cassandra's info can and um, we can certainly dive more into that as we move forward in the coming year. Awesome, thank you all so much. Thank you. I can address um, Hannah's question, which is a really good one. Uh, so all states except for one, um, Michigan, use spreadsheets to track these programs and all states except Michigan hate that. 
Um, no, just kidding. But they, they, it, there are complications, right? Spreadsheets are are not the most efficient way. So, Michigan has um, an online data portal that they, I think, the education department operates themselves and built. And then New Mexico is currently developing one, and it. It might be in the compendium. I think it's called Falling Colors or Falling Waters is the developer. Um, and other than that, no. And I was just looking to see if we have any of our friends from the Department of Education on. I don't see any of them um, from Michigan here, but we had previously worked with um, Farm Logics on a platform, and um, just recently the Department of Education um, brought in that um, role to their own under their own auspices. So they have their own internal tracking system now, um, which allows them for some greater control over that. So that is a interesting change that happened just recently. Ah, yes, Wendy was on earlier. She's our friend at the Department of Education who runs the Tencent's program. And we've got a new question here. What is the link to NSAC's interactive newly introduced policies tool? Karen, do you have any sense on that one? Oh, I think that I think that maybe they meant the um, the state policy map. So I just dropped the link in the chat there because I realized that I had didn't have it pulled up during that slide in the presentation. So that reflects policies that are in the current legislative session, um, and for all of the past policies and achievements, um, including a lot of the the ones that are, have already been implemented. The state policy handbook will be the um, best resource for those. And another question, um, Cassandra, do any of the states make the school district specific purchase data publicly available? The only one I can think of is Oregon, which it's right on the Oregon Farm to Child Nutrition Program website. They have just a full spreadsheet of all of the purchases made and it gets um, updated periodically. Other than that, I don't think so. And part of our job um, as the evaluation partner for 10 cents is to help synthesize um, that purchasing data and report it out. And we try to report it in a way that is uh, more accessible than looking at a gajillion lines of data, which is the work that we have to do. <laughs> so it's a lot of um, effort, a lot of analysis with all of the data that are coming in, but it's really awesome farm to school data, like the details of how farm to school purchases work in action. So it's um, awesome to see, but a lot of work to do. And um, hopefully some of our 10 cents evaluation reporting can be helpful in that way. I'll put in a link to that as well. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So maybe the states aren't publishing the data on their website like Oregon, but maybe their partner nonprofits or their evaluation partners do have that data that maybe you can access. Yeah, so Hannah asks, uh, in the recommendations for designers, coordinators, and policymakers, can you elaborate on conduct extensive research before starting the program? What kinds of research do I recommend? So I think a big one is what, so there's a, there's a couple. What is the current local food procurement threshold in your state? So some states were doing, we're basing this off of the USDA farm to school census, but everyone who mentioned that also recognized that maybe there was a little bit of flaw in using that metric because it is filled out by SFAs um, that might not know different nuanced regulations of local or what's local. So I think doing your own analysis on what that procurement threshold is, what kinds of products are available in the state. So whether you're a big specialty crop state, uh, whether your state already has fluid milk might influence your intent, um, your decision to include it in your incentive or not. 
Um, and then also thinking about how large you want your, um, your incentive to be. So what kind of, yeah, what price point do you want to make it? So in DC, for example, they have a five cent reimbursement, which is great, but it also the coordinator um, that I spoke with shared that it's not large enough for the SFAs in that uh, in the District of Columbia to purchase local protein. So it's not really shifting the plate because local protein is typically more than five cents of non-local protein per, per meal. So those kinds of decisions, the designers could think like, how big do we want to make it? How transformational do we want to make it? What could our budget be? What would that look like? How many grantees sort of just like map out uh, what decisions they make would have different impacts? Those kinds of things. There's a lot more, but those are on the top of my head. And there's another question about the issue of price points. Do states come up with price ranges of what they pay for local food? Um, and inflation has caused for farmers to be hit with huge increases in their own expenses, but schools are still concerned about price. Any thoughts on that? Um, I don't know if states come up with price ranges for what they wanna pay for local food. I think typically, depending on the state, SFAs could purchase it through micro-purchase or through a bidding process in which they can implement a geographic preference policy and more details on that can be found at the National Farm to School Network resource database or the USDA has guidance on geographic preference. Um, that's all I've got on that. Maybe some others on the line have some thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, I think that, that maybe what it's alluding to is that what is the sort of price point that is going to be, um, mm -hmm. that is going to be enough to tip you know, tip behavior that, um, you know, if it's, if it's underpowered, then, you know, maybe, and not, and not enough, it will be sort of, okay, that's nice to match or increase the um, buying power for the stuff I already buy that's local, but it's not enough to shift my purchasing um, because it's not, it's not quite worth it. So I think there's definitely, um, more research needed on what is the appropriate or what is the um the the sort of behavior adjusting or or enough to cover that additional um ingredient or tracking time or or procurement uh, and outreach effort um what's enough to cover it um so that an incentive is appropriately powered um, and if it's underpowered then it will be sort of a nice to have for what you're already doing but it's not going to change anything yeah thanks karen i think back to hannah's question that kind of research i think is really important like how big are we going to make our incentive is it five cents is it 12 cents what is that price point and i think a lot of us in the research community often want to say like X many cents, and we often don't because it is so different from state to state and it by year to year, as was put in the comment. Um, yeah, I don't think we know what a good rate for incentives is, but that would be a great research question. And we had a good conversation about that along the way, Cassandra, I think around how important this question is for program design and how it relates to the goals of the program. So if um, folks who are interested in advocating for these kinds of programs and getting um, more focused on designing them can think through those questions all together, then you know, 10 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents might not be right depending on what you're going for, but that's really part, really important part of thinking through the program design with that intention. And the existing program should not limit your thinking on what is right for you. <laughs> Any other questions?
Right. Not seeing any. So we can wrap it up a little bit early and um, really appreciate Cassandra sharing the wealth of knowledge she gained through her extensive research and Karen for sharing more about what the National Farm to School Network can do and is doing to help support this farm to school policy work broadly, including these types of programs. And as I mentioned, um, we're hoping that we can develop more of a community of practice around nationally around these conversations and um, sharing of more resources and learnings as we go. So that is something that hopefully we can pull together for you in the coming year and we'll be in touch as we have more. We will share out this recording um, as soon as we have it. And thank you all for attending and participating. And again, happy Farm to School Month. <laughs>